Think Forward. Think Research Channel. I am simply delighted to moderate this discussion on the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 75 years after his birth. So we begin with the question, what is the significance of Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy for social justice today in the United States and the world? What does this mean for how we ought to spend this day every year honoring his legacy. And uh, <laughs> Reverend Jackson, I believe you spent his, the last birthday uh, that uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. had alive. And so you might be able to offer us some particularly unique insights in that way. Does it suggest uh, how we ought to strive to make this a better world, that is the celebration of his legacy? What does this struggle mean for people of African descent? On January 15, 1968, uh, around 8 o'clock that morning, he had breakfast with his family. He had convened a national staff meeting. Around 10 o'clock, we met in the basement of his church, had on his windbreaker jacket, blue jeans, a few white staff from Appalachia, <clears throat> some from the Cesar Chavez group there from Southwest Texas, some Jewish allies, uh, Al Lawrence group out of New York, some Native Americans, some blacks from Marks, Mississippi, and Deep South, and labor. A kind of multiracial rainbow coalition of sorts, focusing on a job on income for every American, health care and education, organizing a mass action march to Washington to engage in civil disobedience come by train, by car, by plane, and set up camp in front of Lincoln Memorial because the Emancipation Proclamation promise had been broken. A mass action to Washington. Had to be called multicultural because he knew that that was not going to be a day when you had black full employment and didn't have brown full employment, or white full employment and didn't have brown full employment. So it had to be a multiracial base driven by a shared interest a job and income for every American. He knew full well. Most poor people were not black, they were white, female, and young. He had to get beyond the fears of whites who tend to vote their fears rather than their interests. And for the hopes of blacks with despair, so it was 10 to about one on how to challenge government policy. Around one o'clock, you're on the clay, right on the cake. We stopped him for about an hour. So I know it was his birthday, only we knew really. Then from two to five, we spent how to end the war in Vietnam. We spent the monies that were designed for the war on poverty. It's going to war in Vietnam. So spent his own birthday, A, at home with family, B, organizing a coalition for direct action, mass action, and how to end the war in Vietnam. So those who were there under him on that day must be found somewhere planning how to eliminate poverty how to end wars, and how to make our economy work for all of its people. That's how he spent his own last birthday. And so you think the significance is in that, what we ought to do to celebrate that birthday? Well, because his legacy is what? His legacy is mass action, A, unlike any leader before him. It's mass sacrifice. He was jailed 23 to 26 times, stabbed before he was killed. His impact was to change laws. No other leader changed laws. The 64 Public Accommodations Bill, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Open Housing Act, mass action, body of sacrifice, and changing of laws puts him in a category all unto himself. 
In many ways, when we speak of the significance of the legacy of uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., then um, I, at, at least I take part of that is that you're suggesting that we're talking about forms of social action. Uh, what is the depth of active appreciation of this aspect of, of Reverend King? Like other holidays, uh, has King's birthday also been stripped of its meaning such that it becomes just another day off from work and become just another empty, and has he become just another empty icon uh, that we look at? Do you think that uh, when we are talking about Martin Luther King, uh, and we're talking about Martin Luther King's birthday, that we're talking about the problem of incorporation into the consumerism of modern society? Are we entering the time when we will go to Kmart or Target on the, uh, for a Martin Luther King sale, uh, comparable to Labor Day sale or the President Day sale? Well, he has not become empty. Many of the celebrations have become empty. And the versionary and de facto conservative. I go to too many churches with the pictures of the King in the vestibule and Malcolm in the study and Falwell theology in the pulpit. Just downright retarded <laughs> uh, and, and backwards, you see? Um, that in, for example, I would challenge, and we open that in this year, that every governor, every governor should have a commission. In the, in the tradition of the Colonel Commission, every uh, December they should issue a report state by state. What is the state of racial inequality in Pennsylvania, for example, and the growing class gap? So you have some objective data as opposed to anecdotal references where folks are locked at the Elbow, but not like, not, but not locked at the circumstance. So what? You get the point? <laughs> That's to say that that, for example, what is the the infant mortality gap? It's measurable. It's the life expectancy gap. It's measurable. Access to public education gap. Measurable. Access to college gap. Grad school gap. Measurable. Access to life insurance. Measurable. Access to capital. Measurable. Impact of predator exploitation. Black people and brown people work harder for less money. Pay more for less, more for cars, more for insurance, more for houses, based upon race discrimination. You work harder or for less, pay more for less, live under stress, and don't live as long. I mean, that's our real profile. So, if, if in the King Day celebrations, so now, as for, now, as for year 2004, 2003, what is the plan to close the gap? That's why, that's why we cannot throw away the chronic report because it should be broken down state by state. What is the present state of racial inequality in the state and the present state of, of class gap? Then they bring an Appalachian because most poor people are not black. They're white. There are more poor whites in Appalachia than there are blacks in America, and they too are people. Most people are not black, and, and, and we must whiten the face of poverty to make it real. Mm. Must whiten its face. John killed the hell of a black baby in his arm in Harlem in 1960. It was dismissed as a campaign trick. So he is a liberal guy from up north, and the way northerners they talk funny, and the little black baby. He's trying to please Alan Powell. It was just dismissed. Bobby killed the hell of a, a white baby in his arm from West Virginia. That baby's bloated belly. That baby's running nose and teary eyes, that picture triggered the war on poverty. White poverty is less tolerable than black poverty. Hmm. And to, to that extent, Dr. King knew that a multiracial coalition was critical to changing public policy. You will not get public policy changed because black people are hurting. Matter of fact, you might gain votes for whites by proving that blacks hurt. If I can hurt blacks, I can get votes on counterculture. That's why Bush could uh, put the picture of Dr. King in the White House one day and sent Olson to argue against affirmative action the next day because he knew that our reaction, our reaction would gain him votes on the other side. It's called countercultural politics. He could go and there read to Dr. King breath at Dr. King's grave site one day, and the next day put Pickering on the, on the court. He knew that our reaction would gain action on the white side. That's a calculated kind of cultural political act. And so we must therefore be able to think these things through. Again, Dr. King's legacy became not just mass analysis, but mass action. If 
but for ma mass change. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dyson, do you have anything to add? I, I think that in regard to uh, the, the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., and in regard to whether or not we are celebrating his birthday uh, in, in a specifically redemptive fashion. I think Reverend Jackson has spoken to that. Um, I, I think that we are incapable in America of acknowledging the genuine threat of a militant figure who weds, on the one hand, the most serious language and vocabulary of American democracy and yokes that to a very serious revolutionary tradition generated out of the belly and the womb of an African-American spiritual tradition. That was a, a, a profound marriage. So when I think about Martin Luther King Jr., and I think about his challenge and his legacy, uh, and I think about what the state of that dream is. No, we're not celebrating uh, the incredible dream of Martin Luther King Jr. We have frozen Martin Luther King Jr., freeze froze, froze him uh, into a narrow framework that says he was talking about a dream in 1963. We haven't listened to that whole speech. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope for millions of Negroes who had been, what, enslaved in the manacles. Then he talked about, we have come to the nation's capital to cash a check. In other words, nation better have my money, right? <laughs> But it wasn't just money. He said, I refuse to believe that the great vaults of democracy are empty and the whirlwinds of revolt will begin to shake the foundation of the nation until the Negroes granted his citizenship right. And he said, I want to make it pure and clear that the Negroes in the South can't vote and the Negroes in the North believe they have nothing for which to vote. Then. Mahalia Jackson, after him speaking about police brutality, said, tell him about the dream, Martin. Then he got into the rhetorical articulation of the sunlit summit of hope and aspiration that black people had projected into the world and made it credible, concrete, and made it convincing that white America could hear that dream. Later that year, Dr. King said, I saw my dream turn into a nightmare when those four girls got blown up in 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. So we have frozen Dr. King's legacy to a single moment, 34 words he uttered when he was 34 years old. I have a dream one day my four little children will live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We have turned King into a rhetorical ventriloquist. We're using him to speak words that he articulated without the meanings that he intended. So now, we have conservative brothers and sisters and forces uh, allied against us, what Reverend Jackson brilliantly has talked about as countercultural politics. They've seized upon the rhetoric of Dr. King, but they've emptied the meaning out. The ambition of progressive politics has now been turned against its own use because of that language. So I don't think that we've A, comprehended the complexity of that dream, B, we've frozen King into a narrow moment, C, we haven't talked about the third movement beyond that dream, which is economic and social justice. And when we think about that King's dream, we think about Reverend Jesse Jackson. We think about figures on the front line who see that poor white people in Appalachia are just as dissed as a poor black person in Harlem. And yet the manipulation of their bigotry for poor white brothers and sisters makes them vote against themselves, against their own best interests in alliance with the bigotry. So, Finally, when I think about that dream then, that dream was brilliantly spoken about by Dr. King long before that speech. But it was also talked about after that speech. And what we have to do then is to excavate, dig deep, get underneath the rhetoric, and get down to the moral aspiration. What I mean by that? The hope that human beings who are dissed wherever they are, not only because of their race, but because of their class, because of their sexual orientation, because of their economic inequality, because of their inability to get access to education, because of the gap between the have-gots and the have-nots, and especially within African-American communities when we have the upward mobility of bourgeois Negroes in the White House who speak against the interests of those down, we have to talk about that now. I actually think we make a mistake, big mistake, I'm referring to it as the dream speech. Hmm. That was, it was not the dream speech. It was the broken promise speech. Hmm. Mm -hmm. He had a profound sense of history. He knew that, where well, we are on a timeline, 
1619 to 1865, legally enslaved. Along the way, 1776, July 4th, freed from Britain, but not friend, the enslaved. Seven, six years later, Douglas wants you to celebrate, I can't, I'm a slave, fugitive from slavery. 11 years before Emancipation Proclamation. 17 years before 1865. On that timeline, 1619, 1776, 1852, Douglas, 1857, Dred Scott, 1863, Abraham Lincoln, 1865, 13, 14, 15 amendments. He said, here I stand today. Lincoln, you promised mm. the Emancipation Proclamation. We got the proclamation, mm. not the Emancipation. Congress, you promised 13, 14, 15 amendments. You promised. We join the Union to stop those who engaged in secession, slavery, sedition, and segregation. Now, you honor those who betrayed the nation. You honor those who engaged in treason. They got statues in the Great Hall of Congress. And we can't use a toilet. Right. You broke the promise. Right. That day I was at the march from Texas across to Florida to Maryland. We couldn't use a single public toilet. My house was my house was senior class from South Carolina. We couldn't take a picture in the lawn of the state capitol. The dogs could. Our money was counterfeited. We couldn't buy a hamburger. We couldn't rest on a holiday inn. Black soldiers sat behind lots of POWs. And so here we are today, 100 years later, 1863, 1963, a broken promise. I dream, but they wouldn't the promise to be on it. The promise, the focus must be on the promise, not on the dream, because the dream doesn't have a budget attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> what was the promise was reparations. It was repair for damage done. The promise was Freedmen's Bureau. Mm -hmm. The promise was education for all of the previous enslaved. The promise was some land, some education, some capital. The dream really was about I dream of a day when, and the media has taken the promise, the, 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 the soothing rhetoric of it. King, quote unquote, his, his dream would have been necessary, would have been unnecessary. The promise would have been unnecessary. The march would have been unnecessary. Right. The march was about 100 years after the promise. And we would do well as scholars to study, because a lot of the talk we have about reparations is, 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 is a search for something we know is kind of there, but it kind of starts with the promise, is the promise of it. Repair for damage done. Even the Congress recognized you cannot have 256 years of slavery and walk out and say, David, don't you say free to what? Free to starve? There must be some, there must be some repair for damage done. I hope that we would begin to put our focus not on Dr. King's dream, but on America's broken promise. The Congress promise, the White House promise, and those promises have not been honored. And therein lies our struggle. Not King's dream, but the government's promise. I, I recently, last week, I returned from Senegal. Uh, and while I was in Senegal, I was driving around uh, town and I, I looked up and I noticed I was on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard and I went into a bookstore and I counted at least 10 books translated on Dr. King uh, and it was interesting to me that there was a great amount of enthusiasm about Dr. King's work in Dakar, in Senegal, in West Africa. To what extent do you think uh, Dr. King's dream relevant or the promise has not been fulfilled for the rest of the world? And is there some comparable promise internationally that King's uh, message is relevant to? See, but the reason why I keep kind of challenging the dream bit, uh, Nkrumah went to Lincoln yes. here in Pennsylvania. And many of the African students went to Morehouse and Howard and other schools in the country. So they were aware of American colonialism, American, British, Portuguese colonialism there and, 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 and apartheid here. 
So as I struggle began to move, they were aware of it. Dr. King, 1955 in Montgomery, and Krumah, 1957 in Ghana. That was a profound sense of the relationship with me so far. So that what happened was, uh, the movement here, because America is the most powerful nation with the most capacity to project, like our clothes styles become international, our music style becomes international, our hairstyle becomes international, and so does our struggle. So kids in, in, in South, South Africa were saying, we shall overcome. In Tiananmen Square, saying, we shall overcome. In Gdansk, Poland, we shall overcome. We see ourselves as grasshoppers, we're giants. We have the power to transform the whole world. The world gains strength in our struggle. Much of the third world country struggles, the decolonization movements in Africa and third world countries came from our struggle. We had no, as we marched in Alabama, North Carolina, Georgia, we had no sense that we, in fact, they were listening to us on radio, watching us on TV and news reels. We in America, that's why we're here now tonight, we must project that which is redemptive and not that which is degenerate. Because we have the power to take the, to take the world up or down. We have that power. Uh, in many ways, the national election almost four years ago denied, avoided, and downplayed very crucial issues. Uh, not enough was said about inner cities, very little was said about levels of unemployment, underemployment, and misemployment, and almost nothing was said about the inequalities in wealth and income. And nothing was said about the fact that most more men of African descent are in American jails than in American universities. What does this imply for social justice today? Uh, what did Martin Luther King Jr. do or say that can provide us hope and optimism in the face of these realities? Um, you know, I, I think that when, when you think about the calculus, how you figure out, how you measure, and I think what was important about what Reverend Jesse Jackson has said time and again is that this stuff is not nebulous, it's not ambiguous. You can measure, you can see it. The incarceration of disproportionately African men, increasingly women, in America uh, to the tune of a million, two million, incarcerated altogether. We're the only industrialized nation in the world with this kind of incredible commitment, A, the capital punishment, and B, the expansion of the prison industrial complex on the backs of black and increasingly brown people. Poor white communities about which Reverend Jackson spoke earlier in Appalachia now in our northern industrialized areas and in the outlying areas across the heartland, now find their economic futures bolstered by the privatization of the prison industrial reality. It becomes an enterprise, and it becomes an enterprise, it becomes what? Commodified, turned into something to be bought and sold on the open market. What is that? The future of black and brown America. Why is that? Because increased incarceration means that you can then supplement the income, and in some senses subsidize the local economy through privatized inter enterprises that now deal with prisons. So that the, the funky reality is that black and brown people are being warehoused in these incarceration pens for the capitalist expansion of local communities that need economic support, but not at the expense of brothers and sisters who are black and brown. Number three, the incredible concentration in America of the punitive consequences of incarceration. You know, half the people in prison uh, have medical problems. What do you think happened when Ronald Reagan threw all these people who were homeless because they were mentally diseased the way they're in prison now? So what we end up doing is we begin to criminalize an essentially medical problem then with those who have certain IQs who fall beneath the, the pale, so to speak, who never get addressed. So when you look at the incredible concentration of so-called social pathology around incarceration, it becomes very apparent that we are doing a terrible job and that Martin Luther King Jr. himself was a prisoner. We tend to forget this. He spent time in jail. One of the first experiences he had when he got arrested, when they were taking him to jail, he didn't know they were going because they went way out the way in Montgomery and it scared the crap out of him. Then he talks about going to Birmingham where he wrote one of the most famous letters ever penned from his Birmingham cell. Martin Luther King Jr. was a political prisoner. We have people now who are political prisoners as well, but we don't call them that. We don't speak about 
the reality of their political imprisonment. Let me say this. And Martin Luther King Jr. would be involved in both of those. He would talk about the economic inequality and fundamental social injustice and not only ethnically based and racially informed, but also class based. Because poor white people themselves have been duped by politicians who don't have their best interests at heart. So he would speak to that on the one hand, and he would talk about corporate capitalism and the manifestation of the, the enormous greed that has destroyed so many infrastructures uh, of, of, of uh, political possibility for poor people. Let me end here saying this. It doesn't mean that we're not concerned about people who do the wrong thing. It means that if Amnesty International released a report and it said this, black and brown kids are put in juvenile detention centers, which become warehouses for imprisonment as adults for the same crimes that their white counterparts are hit on the back of the hand for. And black and brown people with a kind of crime and punishment, if you did the crime, you do the time, failing to understand that their children are being sold down the river for the same possibility that young white kids then get reprieved for. Black kid gets put in jail for DWI, white kid becomes president of the United States. There's a hell of a gap right there. Dr. King would say two things. He would also have a, not only did not only he cry against a jails for profit industry, he would also challenge those who go to jail to avoid risky behavior. Right. That's the other side of this question, too. Because he, see, Dr. King did not go to jail for antisocial behavior. He meant to go to jail 25 times. He was on the offensive. He went to jail with moral authority. When I, I'm a jail in the case, they, they, they wouldn't let me come to jail. They put me out of jail. Because <laughs> I went there with an authority different than having been caught selling drugs in the name of my thing. <laughs> I was in jail, Cook County Jail Christmas Day, 12,000 inmates, 9,000 beds. And they said, uh, I want you to help me close this jail down, this screen. Right. So how many of you finished high school? 10% stood. As bad as schools are in Chicago, better than they ever were in Mississippi, mm. in Deep South. I mean, they, they chose not to go to school. Last year in Chicago, we lost $133 million for daily absenteeism. You get money, you know, daily, after, daily uh, attendance. Mm. You lose money on daily absenteeism. We lost $135 million on daily absenteeism. We had the power to end that. Right. $135 million not going to school. Right. Willfully choose entertainment over, over education. So how many of you finish high school? Tim and sister. All right. How many of you uh, have a child at home? Almost all of them stood. Two children at home stood again. Three children. I stopped. Almost all stood again. I said, now how many of you are in here on a nonviolent drug charge? And like 10, 15% stood. Now I know that 85% of all rural arrests are white. 76% of all urban arrests are white, and 55 of those in jail are blacks. I know that what the data is. It's so, like, will you help me close the jail down? They scream, yeah, what can we do? So don't come back no more. <laughs> <laughs> My point is that, <laughs> <laughs> My point is, <laughs> we have the power to stop recidivism. Right. It's no given you've got to go back to jail. So it's no given that you have to have drugs. It's no given that you have to rob people in your own neighborhood. It's no given you have to rape people. So he would challenge both sides. Yes, there is a jail industrial conflict. There's also some burden to make right choices because they have a choice as a consequence. Life is full of choices and consequences. I got every pathology a black man can have. As they describe it these days, it's pathology. Born out of wedlock. Teenage mother, deep south, having said all of that stuff, I still must live with the, the, the choice of my customers and my choices. I cannot avoid being responsible. I cannot avoid being responsible. I have the right to fight for the right. I must sharpen my tools to win the fight. Uh, let me thank you, Reverend Jackson, uh, Professor Dyson. Thank you all for being an excellent audience.